The muffled drum's sad roll has beat the soldier's last tattoo. No more on life's parade shall meet that brave and fallen few. On fame's eternal camping ground, their silent tents are spread, and glory guards with solemn round the bivouac of the dead. The neighing troop, the flashing blade, the bugle's stirring blast, the charge, the dreadful cannonade, the din and shout are past. Nor war's wild note, nor glory's peal shall thrill with fierce delight those breasts that nevermore may feel the rapture of the fight. That's an interesting verse for them to have chosen Roosevelt and Lodge in Hero Tales uh, to introduce the Battle of the Alamo, uh, particularly that final line, the breast that nevermore may feel the rapture of the fight. Well, most wouldn't think of the Alamo as a rapture joyful fight, but a, a rather bitter and desperate one. But Roosevelt and Lodge want us to look at that battle for the sake of what it can teach us. Uh, and of course, I'm going to agree with them and take a look at it together with them and with you today. 1836. They opened their story here with the line, Thermopylae had its messengers of death, but the Alamo had none. Well, what in the world are they talking about? And why do they figure that uh, everyone will get it when they reference Thermopylae? Thermopylae was the last stand of a band of 300 Spartan warriors fighting the invading Persian army. And what they were doing at that narrow mountain pass, those 300 men against tens of thousands, was slowing down the advance of the huge Persian army long enough for their Greek allies to put together an army, uh, to put together some resistance that would actually have a chance of winning against the Persians. But the Spartans at Thermopylae, those 300, had no chance of winning themselves or of surviving, and they knew it. And they fought bravely, and every school child knew this story. So that's the story that came to mind as Lodge and Roosevelt describe the battle that was so similar in some ways of the Alamo in 1836, where a small force of men in an old Spanish mission made of adobe uh, held the mission as a fort in order to slow down the enormous army of the Mexican dictator Santa Ana. And in this story of the Alamo, Roosevelt and Lodge see it primarily as a fight between Santa Ana as commander of a vast army and a group of American frontiersmen. And all through this book, American Hero Tales, we've seen Roosevelt and Lodge praise the good qualities of tough men who grew up on the frontier. Well, let's get to their story. Soon after the close of the Second War with Great Britain, and that would be the War of 1812, parties of American settlers began to press forward into the rich, sparsely settled territory of Texas, then a portion of Mexico. At first, these immigrants were well received, but the Mexicans speedily grew jealous of them and oppressed them in various ways. In consequence, when the settlers felt themselves strong enough, they revolted against Mexican rule and declared Texas to be an independent republic. Immediately, Santa Ana, the dictator of Mexico, gathered a large army and invaded. The slender forces of the settlers were unable to meet his hosts. They were pressed back 
by the Mexicans and dreadful atrocities were committed by Santa Ana and his lieutenants. Santa Ana had a reputation as a man without mercy. In the United States, there was great enthusiasm for the struggling Texans, and many bold backwoodsmen and Indian fighters swarmed to their help. Among them, the two most famous were Sam Houston and Davy Crockett. Okay, the importance of selecting Houston and Crockett as examples. Hold on. Houston doesn't appear on this wall of the Alamo's defenders, this beautiful sculpture, because he wasn't present. Sam Houston was gathering the Texan forces. He was rallying an army to meet Santa Ana's army, and Houston needed time to do that. The men on the spot here, Travis and Crockett and Bowie uh, and 13 South Carolinians in total, including one man whose brother would later be a governor of our state. Those were the men on the spot who were here to defend the mission. So let's look at that most famous of them, Davy Crockett, painting with him there on the left. As Roosevelt describes him, Davy Crockett was born soon after the Revolutionary War. He too had taken part under Jackson in the campaigns against the Creeks and had afterwards become a man of mark in Tennessee and had gone to Congress as a Whig. But he had quarreled with Jackson and been beaten for Congress. And in his disgust, he left the state and decided to join the Texans. He was the most famous rifle shot in all the United States and the most successful hunter, so that his skill was a proverb all along the border. And this will be the last of our American hero tales in which the uh, Kentucky rifle, that extremely accurate flintlock weapon, um, plays a part in a supporting role. Uh, and um, Crockett's use of his uh, muzzle-loading rifle and that of the other Texians, as they were then called, in the Alamo, um, brings to a, to a close a story that began for us uh, in this book with Daniel Boone and proceeded on through Kings Mountain and various other fights. David Crockett journeyed south by boat and horse, making his way steadily toward the distant plains where the Texans were waging their life and death fight. Texas was a wild place in those days, and the old hunter had more than one hairbreadth escape from Indians, desperados, and savage beasts ere he got to the neighborhood of San Antonio and joined another adventurer, a bee hunter, bent on the same errand as himself. Old Crockett and his companion never wavered, coming upon the Alamo already under siege. They were fearless and resolute and masters of woodcraft, and they managed to slip through Mexican lines and join the defenders within the walls. The bravest, the hardiest, the most reckless men of the border were there. Among them were Colonel Travis, the commander of the fort. And there's Travis, the South Carolinian there. And Bowie, the inventor of the famous Bowie knife. That would be the man the right in this dual slide. They were a wild and ill-disciplined band, little used to restraint or control, but they were men of iron courage and great bodily power, skilled in the use of their weapons and ready to meet with stern and uncomplaining indifference, whatever doom fate might have in store for them. The defenders knew there was scarcely a chance of rescue and that it was hopeless to expect that 150 men behind defenses so weak, could beat off 4,000 trained soldiers, well-armed and provided with heavy artillery. But they had no idea of flinching and made a desperate defense. The days went by and no help came. While Santa Ana got ready his lines and began a furious cannonade. There is that word again, cannonade and bombardment. 
His gunners were unskilled, however, and he had to serve the guns from a distance. For when they pushed nearer, American riflemen crept forward under cover and picked off the artillerymen. Old Crockett thus killed five men at one gun. But by degrees, the bombardment told the walls of the Alamo were battered and riddled, and they had been breached so as to afford no obstacle to the rush of the soldiers. Santa Anna commanded that they be stormed. The storm took place on March 6th, 1836. The Mexican troops came on well and steadily, breaking through the outer defenses at every point, for the lines were too long to be manned by the few Americans. The frontiersmen retreated to the inner building in a desperate hand-to-hand -hand conflict followed, the Mexicans thronging in, shooting the Americans with their muskets, thrusting at them with lance and bayonet, while the Americans, after firing their long rifles, clubbed them and fought desperately, one against many. And they also used their bowie knives and revolvers with deadly effect. The fight reeled to and fro between the shattered walls, each American the center of a group of foes. But for all their strength, and their wild fighting courage, the defenders were too few. The struggle could have but one hand. One by one, the tall riflemen succumbed until but three or four were left. Colonel Travis, so was Bowie, sick and weak from a wasting disease, but who rallied all his strength to die fighting, and who in this final struggle slew several Mexicans with his revolver and his big knife of the kind to which he had given his name. The last man stood at bay. It was old David Crockett. Wounded in a dozen places, he faced his foes with his back to the wall, ringed about by the bodies of the men he had slain. So desperate was the fight he waged that the Mexicans who thronged round about him were beaten back for the moment, and no one dared to run in upon him. Accordingly, while Lancers held him where he was, for weakened by wounds and loss of blood, he could not break through them. The musketeers loaded their carbines and shot him down. Santa Anna declined to give him mercy. Some say when Crockett fell from his wounds, he was taken alive and was then shot by Santa Anna's order. His fate cannot be told with certainty, for not a single American was left alive. At any rate, after Crockett fell, the fight was over. Every one of the hardy men who had held the Alamo lay still in death, yet they died well avenged for four times their number fell at their hands in the battle. Santa Anna had but a short while to exult over his bloody and hard-won victory. Already a rider from the rolling plains going north through the Indian territory had told Houston that the Texans were up and were striving for their liberty. At once there kindled a longing to return Mounting his horse, he rode south and was hailed by Texans as a heaven-sent leader. He took command of their forces, 1,100 stark riflemen. And at the Battle of San Jacinto, he and his men charged the Mexican hosts with the cry of, Remember the Alamo! Almost immediately, the Mexicans were overthrown with terrible slaughter. Santa Ana himself was captured and the freedom of Texas won at a blow. And here we see again that Beautiful tribute sculpture to the defenders of the Alamo. So, an American military epic, a 13 day siege that goes down as, as one of the most heroic actions in our history. What do Roosevelt and Lodge want us to learn this time? And they always they always have something in mind. Well, sometimes they have talked about well-disciplined American troops. Sometimes they have not. Recall this description. They were a wild and ill-disciplined band, little used to restraint or control. But they were men of iron courage and great bodily powers. Strenuous life again. Skilled in the use of their weapons. And again, that little note about the long rifle and how the riflemen were able to knock artillery soldiers off the artillery pieces to force Santa Ana to move 
his artillery back to a less effective spot. And ready to meet with stern and uncomplaining indifference whatever doom fate might have in store. So we get reinforced by Roosevelt and Lodge here that an American, um, that the American spirit is forged by the, the frontier, by the challenges of life that these men have overcome, uh, that even though David Crockett is coming out of Congress, um, Roosevelt and Lodge don't talk a lot about what he did in Congress, but about what made him a, a hunter and a scout in the first place, the virtues of the frontier, the good things that came from the wilderness life. And time after time, they've talked about that. But remember, a couple of times they haven't. Francis Parkman lived very little of the wilderness life, and it gave him health problems. Um, you can't really say Governor Morris lived the wilderness life at all, or John Quincy Adams. But we see in their cases still that stern and uncomplaining indifference to whatever doom fate might have in store for them. That is, they are content to face the danger and hardship that comes their way because they have a greater purpose. That, I think, is what Roosevelt and Lodge want us to pull out of the story of the Battle of the Alamo. Next Tuesday at 9, when we return to this book, we will get to that period in American history when Americans fight the most deadly and challenging of adversaries, um, Americans. Our next story will be the Battle of Hampton Roads, uh, the first clash between ironclads. And please join me for that on Tuesday morning with your coffee and a few minutes to spare for the contemplation of history. Thank you all for being here today uh, and look forward to seeing you again. Uh, do I have any questions before we wrap things up?